I'd be delighted. I just want to take a little check to make sure I can be heard. Somebody could maybe give me a wave if you can hear me. Excellent. Okay, perfect. Well, first, what a pleasure it is to be here. I only wish I could be there in person for the beautiful view. Uh, and I'll start out by confessing that I have a little bit of a checkered history since I was uh, a member of the International Trade Commission when we voted to impose safeguards on lamb meat from the world, including New Zealand. Uh, but on the other hand, I served at the WTO appellate body um, and was a member of the division that decided the New Zealand apples case um, in favor of New Zealand. So I hope I have at least some modicum of support or what, whatever recognition on either side. Well, let me, let me sort of talk a little bit about how significant I think the crisis of facing the appellate body is, uh, because there's no question that we are on the precipice of having the rules-based system, or certainly the dispute settlement arm of the rules-based system, uh, collapse, um, and collapse basically at the behest of one country, the United States, and I would argue not even everybody in the United States agrees with this decision. So we are really at a dire point uh, because I think it has to be understood what happens if you don't have an appellate body. Um, and we are perilously close to not having one. Um, as of December 11th of this year, uh, we will not have a functioning appellate body. And what that means is that if anybody doesn't like the outcome of a panel decision, um, what they need to do to block it is to simply file a notice of appeal because under the rules, nothing can move forward until the appeal has been completed. And if, there's only, if there isn't any functioning appellate body, the appeal will never be completed. Uh, so you, you again, you'll simply be blocking the results. The other reason why I think this is so significant is because of the historical context in which this sits. Uh, the United States, in when we joined the WTO in 1995, along with New Zealand and, and most of the other original members of the WTO, um, basically did so by saying, we agreed that we're going to give up our unilateral rights to engage in putting tariffs on and doing other things in exchange for a binding dispute settlement system that would not add to the obligations or detract from the rights that the U.S. understood it to have in the WTO agreement. And the narrative that is going around Washington today is that the appellate body broke that bargain. And therefore, all bets are off, and the United States is somehow now entitled. Oops. Yesterday, um, I'm sorry, okay or not okay? Okay. <laughs> Anyway, I, th I think you saw even yesterday uh, President Trump tweeting that he was going to add an additional 25% tariff to $350 billion worth of Chinese product, that he was going to increase the tariffs on China from 10 to 25%. Again, totally unilateral behavior that is a total violation of the United States' obligations. But again, it's part of this narrative to say that all bets are off because the appellate body has broken the bargain. Um, and when the United States says that, I think it's important to understand what exactly are they referring to? How is it that the appellate body has... Uh, because if you listen to Donald Trump, I mean, the first thing you'll hear him say, and I'll quote, the WTO has treated the United States very badly, um, which is just flat out not true. I mean, the United States has been the biggest winner from the WTO dispute settlement system. The United States has brought more cases than any other country. And when we're on the offensive, bringing cases like the Indonesia case that you mentioned with New Zealand, the United States has won more than 85% of the time. So we've benefited far more than, than, any, than any other country. And on the other hand, and this is where the narrative really comes down to, when we have been challenged, particularly for our trade remedy actions, that's our anti-dumping cases, and that's our safeguards cases, and our, and our kind of duty cases, the United States has largely lost, and it's those losses that have created this huge narrative um, that the appellate body has taken away various rights that the United States had and needs to be shut down. Um, so what is, what is the U.S. really saying? They're saying a number of very specific things that I'll, I'll mention really quickly about what's wrong with this system. What they're not saying, but what I think is underlying this crisis, is that, the, that at least... Um, President Trump and more importantly his United States Trade Representative Bob Lighthizer 
want to go back to a power-based might makes right kind of a system. Um, their view, I think, is that the United States is better off without a binding dispute settlement system because we're bigger, tougher, badder, whatever you want to describe, um, than anyone else, and that somehow we will win um, if we can go back to a power-based rules system. And I fear that that is a lot of what is undergirding um, this United States' blockage. Um, and for Bob Lighthizer, I think his view is we were better off in the old GATT system, uh, which, which was the system of, of trade rules that existed between 1947 and 1995. 1947 when the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade was created, up until 1995 when the WTO came into existence. And there's two important differences between what happened in the GATT system versus what happens today in the WTO. First is that you could block the creation of a panel. So if you thought the subject of whatever the panel was was too sensitive, too difficult, you could simply say, I don't even want a panel to consider it at all. And you see this coming back now today. The United States has said repeatedly to everybody that's challenging the United States' steel and aluminum tariffs, we don't want a panel at all. Um, we think that that is a matter of our national security, and we do not think there should be any panel that looks at the national security of the United States. So you see us coming back to this idea that we liked it better in the old GATT days. The second part of it is, in the old GATT days, if you went ahead and had a panel, but you didn't like the outcome, you blocked the adoption of the panel report. And that, again, is exactly what Bob Lighthizer is trying to get back to when he says he wants to kill the appellate body, because that, again, means that all you have to do is file a notice of appeal in order to block um, the adoption of a panel report. So I think the perception, at least, of some, including, uh, again, the president of Bob Lighthizer, is let's go back to the old days where there was no binding dispute settlement. And that, I think, is very dangerous, not just for the United States, but I think is particularly dangerous um, for smaller countries like New Zealand, um, who really need a rules-based system and an adjudicatory body that can stand by that. So again, if I just touch really quickly on, so what is the United States really complaining about? Um, part of it is very fairly technical things um, that can arguably relatively easily fixed um, but which the United States uses the fact that decisions are made by consensus, so it, all it takes is one country, including just the United States, to object to never have the system get fixed. So, for example, one of the first things that they're complaining about is the rules say that all decisions of the appellate body must be made in 90 days. The problem is the cases are getting bigger and more complicated, and there's now only three appellate body members to hear all of these appeals, so it's just not as possible to get all of the appeals done in 90 days. But yet, that's what the rules say. So the United States' argument is every time the appellate body doesn't issue a report in 90 days, it means the appellate body itself is breaking the rules, and that's what they're objecting to. Second thing the United States is objecting to, the rules that were established say that if you're starting on an appeal, working on an appeal, when you are a member of the appellate body, but your term expires before you finish, you can stay on and finish the appeal that you were assigned to. If the, the United States, again, is arguing, no, 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 that's not the rule. That effectively means that the appellate body member themselves is deciding that my term is not four years, my term is actually four and a quarter years, because I'm gonna spend an additional quarter year finishing the case. I'm holding over against the rules. So again, the United States is saying, appellate body, you're being arrogant, you're breaking the rules, you're deciding these things that you're not supposed to decide. Third issue the United States complains about, the appellate body is supposed to make rulings only on questions of law. And increasingly, the argument is that the appellate body is in fact digging back into the facts that they're not supposed to deal with. They're, they're second guessing a panel's determination about whether it made an objective assessment of the facts. And the appellate body is treating that assessment of did the panel make an objective assessment of the facts as a legal question that's giving them a backdoor route into being a second factual examiner. Again, the United States would argue in violation of the rules. So again, the, 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 the specific things that the U.S. is complaining about are fairly technical, but I think they have to be regarded in this bigger context of this overall sense that what does the U.S. really want 
um, I fear is it really wants to go back to a non-rules-based, power-based, might makes right system. So that, that's my real concern. And my concern above all else is we need to fix this before it's broken. I don't think um, that if we allow a binding dispute settlement system to die, um, that it will be very easy for it to come back again. I think it was a really unique confluence events in the 1990s that allowed the United States to sign on to this binding dispute settlement system. You have to remember the United States is not a member of the International Court of Justice. We are not a party to the International Criminal Court. We are not a party to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. The United States fundamentally does not join any international tribunals, and yet we join the WTO. Why? Uh, why? It really relates to the fact that the WTO agreements went through where for those members of Congress that would be the ones saying, I will never allow the United States to join the International Court of Justice, were on the other hand saying, wow, but I really like this agriculture agreement. Oh, but I really like this agreement on SPS, or I really like this fact that we've got intellectual property disciplines in the WTO, and they were prepared to trade off whatever concerns they had about a binding dispute settlement system in order to get the things that they wanted in the Uruguay round. I don't think that kind of a trade-off is likely to come again. So I'm hoping that others around the world will join in and find a way to fix these issues at the appellate body before, before it's too late. And, and I'll stop there with just sort of opening comments and, and listen in on the rest of it and be more than happy to answer um, any questions from, from here on. Uh, thank you so much.